Now, going back to the truth argument, that we think truth is just propositions, statements that are supposed to be true or false. That's what got me into the independent statements. There are three other forms of truth. And this comes from John Verveke. I mean, you heard Terrence Howard do this with, I imagine you listened to the Eric Weinstein one he did with him? A bit. Okay. So there were different points in there where Terrence would say things like, well, we that line's not perfectly straight. If we put a micro, if we put a mi microscope over it, it would prove that there's a little bit of curvature there, or something like that. Like he would do things like that, meaning questioning something that, like, the base point that we can all agree on. He'd be like, "No, we can't agree on that. Hold on a minute." Yes. So, can we ever really prove anything if we can't prove that, for example, maybe these seven chords right here aren't actually seven chords, and we're living in some other space-time dimension that makes it look like it's seven, but seven isn't even the thing that we even understand to be seven? So, what you're asking now about is. Proving something mathematically is different than proving something physically. And people make a mistake of thinking that the map of math is the same as the territory of the physics. So you can describe the physical world, whatever that means, with math. It doesn't mean that that math corresponds to the physical world, although you can make a, you can make a, a structural argument and show, hey, with experiments, when we map it out with this math, then we get the answers that we predict. Mm -hmm. And so you can say there is some correspondence in structure, sure. But does that mean that the f underlying reality is truly what the math says? We don't know. But in Terence's case about the... Let me just get back to infinity zero and Please. infinity one. It's technically called Aleph zero and Aleph one for whatever reason. The independent question, the question that it turns out is not true or false, is, is there another infinity between infinity zero and infinity one? Sure, we can construct a higher infinity from this, from the countable infinity. Okay, cool. Is there an in-between one? That's called the continuum hypothesis. It turns out that's independent of the axioms of set theory, which is what people use to build math. So there are other questions that seem like, these seem contrived. These seem like contrived examples of independent questions. But there's another one about if you have a graph and you have little dots on the graph and can you color the dots in different ways such that when you attach a vertice that you can assign a different color and no two colors are matching. It's called the Paris-Harrington theorem. So something that actually has, or seems like it has, application, not just this sentence is false, not just is there an infinity between two infinities. There is an independent statement that isn't Gerdelian, even though it's a, it technically is a Gerdelian statement. G-O-D-E-L. If, if you have someone, though, like a Terrence Howard, for, forget Terrence Howard, actually. If you have anyone, though, who's coming up with, let's say, a lot of ideas that are provably wrong, right? Out of what they say, nine out of ten things are wrong. But the tenth thing isn't necessarily right, but it's asking a question that maybe we haven't answered all the way. Do you view that as a net win or a net loss for the conversation of science? For me, conversing with the person, if it was private, I would consider it a win. Just because uh, any conversation, this conversation, both you and I, hopefully, we care about one another and we're not trying to deceive one another. That's right. And we're trying to say what's interesting and we're aware that there are some cameras and some microphone equipment and some guy. Who's <laughs> 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 some guy, Alessi, behind the, behind the whole thing. Yes, sure, we're aware of that, but that's in our periphery and we're just trying to converse with one another. And so if that was the spirit of the conversation, then... I would consider it a win. But you say in private, not in public? Well, no, I also think in public. I also think that, that it, as long as it's truthful, now going back to the truth argument, that we think truth is just propositions, statements that are supposed to be true or false. That's what got me into the independent statements. There are three other forms of truth. And this comes from John Verveke. There's a participatory truth, which means what is it like to participate in something? Dancing. There's some truth to dancing. Mm -hmm. there's a truth to procedure, so procedural truth. That is to say, you can grasp this phone, you can grasp it incorrectly. You think that has nothing to do with truth, but there's the truth of an arrow, so the arrow's path is true. The word true has a historical root that isn't just propositions, although the problem is that in our modern parlance, we think truth is just propositions, and we've forgotten about the procedural aspect of truth, the participatory aspect of truth, and the perspectival aspect of truth. So the four truths, this comes from John Verveke, 
propositional. That's what most people think the truth is. Then there's procedural, moving. Then there's participatory. Then there is perspectival. The perspectival one is a bit tricky to explain. More like, what is it like to be? What is it like to be from your position? Many people say that has to do with consciousness. What is it like? When I think of topics like pretty much everything we've just discussed vis-a-vis -vis math and physics, my brain gets fried getting ahead of myself. And what I mean by that is there's always a layer deeper in either direction. Let's, so, use, let, let's use numbers, right? If I want to go to zero, I have to keep on adding what? Infinite decimal places. There's never a place where it goes completely to zero where nothing went to something that we can concept in our head. But it's the same thing in the other direction. When I go to count up at some point, I don't even have a term for the number I count. And I know that there are what? Infinite more numbers that I can count to. So when I realize that we are barred in by what the human collective intelligence has been able to term are the deepest numbers that we can even look at from to us exponential figures in both directions that could just be once it is in all likelihood one small speck though of the actual knowable numbers in the universe it starts to make me then wonder if i go deep enough on that like well do we really know anything then if we just have one small snapshot of the entire thing that's right so the idea about you have doors and you can explore them and that's what the curious mind is supposed to do yeah. is the Lou Elizondo statement that I think is the most profound of all the six hours or so of all the statements he said, which is, what are you going to do now? Is saying, forget about going through different doors. There are people in the room with you already. How do you treat them? And that has to do with the other three forms of truth. I think you lost me on that one. There's So instead of walking through doors, you're saying, assume you already have people with you. How do you treat them? What does that have to do with what we're talking about, though? I know you know. I just don't know. Have you heard the phrase, and at the end of all our searching, we'll be to arrive where we began and know the place for the first time? T.S. Eliot, I believe. Mm. I think I have heard that, actually. So what... What I wonder is, then what? Then what? Okay, suppose you get some revelation about something. Then what? What are you going to do? For me, it could be that you said the answer is that it's there are many numbers and they're beyond us and we have a snapshot. It could be that. It could also be that the universe is fractal-like and, and that there's the world in a, in a grain of sand. There's another quote about see the world in a grain of sand. It could be that. You have an element of the truth, and you're searching for it out there. Mm. And the truth is, is leniency, it's forbearance, tenderness, devotion. It's a form of truth that we don't think has anything to do with the truth. John Verveke pins the meaning crisis. He's the one who studies the meaning crisis. He may have coined that term or popularized it. Have you had him on your podcast? A few times, yeah. I'm going to listen to those. Sure. Go ahead. He says, it's it's quite interesting because many people will say, well, the meaning crisis since the nuclear age, we, we've lost meaning, blah, 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 blah. He says, no, it came about since the 1100s. Why? Because we introduced vowels, something like that. How the heck does vowels have anything to do with meaning? <laughs> he said, what happened was we used to read aloud and it was a rare skill. We think, okay, it's great. We are literate now. What happens is that then you introduce vowels and spaces and reading becomes easier and you start to ascribe more reality to what's easier, what's cognitively more easy to process. That may be another reason why some psychedelic trips have a element of reality to them such that when you come back to this world, this is the one that feels like the dream world because there's a cognitive loop that's on hmm. steroids. And I forgot what the name is, but I can send you it. Okay. And it has to do with processing. Now, what's interesting is that we also, yes, we ascribe more truth to what is easier to, to comprehend. 
So if someone's speaking, Nietzsche's fantastic, man. Nietzsche has these aphorisms. He says, the person who is deep tries to be clear. The person who isn't tries to be obscure. Mm. For the crowd presumes that what it can't see to the bottom of must be deep. Oh, that is fucking brilliant. I might, I, might, I might put that on a picture and hang it in the studio. That's a good, that's a bar. So partly with the theories of everything podcast, what I'm trying to do is to simplify as much as possible, but simplify not to the point of whittling away some concept so that it no longer resembles the original, but to speak in as plain language as one can. Anyhow, Verveke would say, look, we've now prioritized reading. Reading has to do with the propositional. And we've lost analog. So this, just a conversation, even walking and talking, there's a whole philosophical school of peripatetics. I mm. There's more. So even, so Nassim Talib, another great writer, fantastic writer, said, there is, there are ancillary uses to something analog that become primary. So for instance, a book. We think, oh, we capture the book by putting it on Kindle. No, you've digitized the book and you've made some lossy conversion. So you haven't captured the full essence of a book. Why? The because there, there's the feel. I asked my wife this the other day. If it's the case that the Kindle books cost the same as a real book and you didn't have to worry about transportation and so on, would you prefer the real book? And she said, yes. Because then this is the case for most people. There's something about the feel of it. There's something about opening it up. There's also, Nassim said, there is something about a physical book that you put in behind you and you look brighter. Because look how many uh, books I have. So there's another element to it. You can, He said, right now I'm typing on a laptop propped up by a book. So there are other uses of a book that don't get captured when it goes to Kindle. And he said, there are these auxiliary uses to a physical object. So for instance, aspirin, when it was first proposed or first invented, even though mm -hmm. it came from a, a leaf that was known about for a while. So let's say it was introduced for runners so that you can run faster. Then, it real, then you realize, okay, it's not for that. Then you think, okay, maybe it's because maybe I can introduce it to people who need to drink more water. It encourages them to drink water. So on, so on, so on. Then you get side effects. Viagra was like that. Yes. Side what effect. did that start with? That was supposed for the to heart. Be, yeah, for the heart. It's so like you, you find your something primary powerful. Use, your primary use is actually not the best use. We're not smart enough to mm. know the primary uses. The analog is far smarter than us. I we think we've I captured. We think we can capture a single element of it, and then also, by the way, there's a privacy element to this because as soon as you digitize something, it becomes tracked. Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.